such a privilege always to be in God's Word. Before I begin in our passage today that was in your reading of 2 Corinthians 4, 13 to 18, just to mention uh, something that is always should be on our hearts and minds, and that is there's so many in our midst that are suffering from various disease and problems and issues, and we encourage you to pray consistently for them. There's a prayer listing out there in the rack in the foyer, and please take that to every Sunday and uh, as it's updated and make use of it. I would mention two real quickly that you're probably already familiar with, but maybe not. Uh, one of those, of course, is Lona Langthorpe, who fell this past week and has uh, had a break, a fracture on her jaw, and it's She's been to the hospital and had surgery and sewed up. Uh, I know she would appreciate her, her and her, your prayers. Uh, Janice Kennedy, who used to be sitting right back there with Andy. She's frail anyway, and she's been fighting pneumonia now for a number of days and continues to fight pneumonia. And uh, pray for her. Pray for her. Now, we're in this portion of scripture where Paul is really defending himself from these false teachers, false prophets that have entered the Corinthian church and in the process and the providence of God of defending himself, he really exposes to us what ministry should be and I think beyond that even what we should be as Christians in our thinking and in our attitude. And we come to a very precious section now that is really focused on something that should be very dear to our hearts. That is eternity. Eternity. So I'm going to try the best I can to unfold this before us and help us all, myself included, to get our heads straight about our priorities and thinking in life as followers of Jesus Christ. So bow with me again as I would uh, ask the Lord to help us. Father, indeed, so thankful this morning to sing these wonderful hymns, to praise you from the heart, to give thanks to you. And Father, no matter what our status is today, that we can give thanks to you for we have a wonderful future ahead of us. Help me to speak concerning this, I pray thee. And use this time for your glory. Teach us from your word and from the providential speaking through Paul that you have done here that we some 2,000 years later might be edified, corrected in our thinking, in love with you even more loving your word and loving your promises, we praise you today. Give us all ears to hear and change us from within. We ask in Christ's name, amen. I love the words of Isaiah 1.18 where he says, Come, let us reason together. If you get right down to it, now he goes on to talk about though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. But really and truly, the Word of God is always what I would call logical. It could not be anything else. And our study today is basic logic, really coupled with a sense of measurement. Now living in these last days, the masses of people are rarely confronted with truth, and many in religion have also fallen prey to this spurious emphasis on the better life now. Such a emphasis is practically no different, if you really consider it and think about it, than the atheist, or the people that would really have no opinion about God one way or the other, an agnostic. The better life is not the emphasis of those of faith, nor the emphasis of Scripture. The now for the Christian is indeed a life of faith, and it is shown by commitment and service and perseverance. 
pointing to a promised new age and coming world of righteousness that God has promised from the very beginning after the fall when he said that there would one come that would crush the head of Satan. And the great motivation in this faith is the future promised of God, what is called even in the most well-known passage of Scripture, John 3, 16, as eternal life. Now, you know that the Bible alone explains the origin of man's dilemma in sin and his troubles in sin and what was lost in the garden where God had told them before they ever ate of that tree and warned them that dying, if you eat of it, you shall surely die. Not, a, not just a, a physical death, which is true because the grass withers and the flower fades and we are but a vapor that appears for a little while, but also spiritual death, that is separation eternally from God. Of course, the gospel is Jesus Christ because he defeated death and he promises eternal life for those of us that don't deserve it because of our sin and who we are but he died in our place that we might have life eternally and he died to restore this eternal relationship with God and so even before I begin I think with me think with me honestly and sincerely that nothing, and I mean nothing, matters closely at all by comparison to this. To have a relationship with God that is eternal. Nothing can possibly compare with that. And that's why Christ, you know, said that what does it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Absolutely nothing. It is worthless by comparison. So Paul here, and I've titled this particular little section of or paragraph, Serving for Eternity, in verses 13 to 18, he explains the promise of eternal life as his ministry motivation. And he is our example, therefore, we are to mirror him in our thinking and attitude and service to God. Whatever level we're at in that regard, Christ said, man is in spiritual darkness and loves darkness rather than light, which means he is naturally, spiritually, illogically blind. And, he, and this blindness carries into just the very basics of what I have described about our relationship looking forward into eternity. In fact, I, I do believe that most people refuse to consider the terms of death, living as if it will never happen to them. And yet nothing is more certain. I know people say death and taxes, but really even the taxes may go away, probably not. But death won't go away except for the Christian, perhaps, if he's living when the rapture occurs. But all otherwise must die. In the great hall of faith in Hebrews 11, we see the heroes of faith. They lived by faith in light of eternity. And that's the only explanation for the fact that they were living in caves and holes in the ground and some of them were sawn in two and fed to animals and all those other things that are described. We have the description, for example, of Moses in Hebrews eleven twenty six that he turned away from the passing pleasures of Egypt's royalty to be ill-treated with the people of God. Why? He was looking for the reward. Abraham when he was told of God to sacrifice his son of promise, knowing God could raise him from the dead and would raise him from the dead if necessary, was all about the eternal nature of our relationship with God. And our text today is all about Paul's ministry in the face of eternity, and that's what we just read about. 
And having a right perspective on this establishes our priorities as it did Paul's. Our, pri our priorities for living. Having an eternal perspective looks at life from the one who controls it all. We should be looking at life from God's view, and we do that by being in God's word, engaging God's truth. His truth is the, is the measurement for a preparatory living as we face eternity. Now, some of you have seen this before, and it's not the best example, but it's an example, I think, that is, has a testimony. Here we have a rope, and I want you to think with me on this rope that we have here, that this rope goes out that door there, and probably almost everybody in this room has driven down Interstate 10, so it goes through all the way through San Antonio, and it goes to I-10, and it starts down I-10, and through uh, Schulenburg, and then all the way to Houston down I-10, but no, it doesn't stop at Houston. It goes beyond Houston over to where the Smiths came from in Baton Rouge, and it goes past there way over into Florida, into Tallahassee, and then it, it goes to the far coast of Florida and goes down that coast to Cape Canaveral. And there that rope, which you can already see is trying to just register how long that is, is ridiculously long, is carried by a Titan rocket into the space and traveling beyond 186,000 miles per second of speed of light, it heads out into eternity and just keeps on going. It's a long rope, isn't it? Well, this rope in my measurement here, I want you to think in terms of a visual, because it's really inadequate in that, of your life. Because everyone's life is eternal. We're all going to reside somewhere in eternity. We were created to live on and on. And in comparison to what I have just described, see that red portion there? That's your life right now compared to the remaining portion that I have described. Now that gets into God's view, and we could get into conversation about the fact that God created time, and once we get in the Bible to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, I don't think there's any indication of any time there. It really doesn't matter because it's eternity. But it goes on and on. So you see... How little is our time here as compared to the time that is there? And so now we begin to understand, just begin to understand what our Lord Jesus meant in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth or moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where none of that occurs. Now, this context that we're looking at this morning is where, where Paul continues addressing this church dealing with these false professors and he moves his focus now. He's, he's moved it and moved it and moved it and moved it, and we can't rehash all of that. But he's moving his focus now to the motivation behind everything that he does in that little span of time that it was his life, that he lived a short period of time. may have seemed long at the time, but it wasn't. And neither is ours, because we are just a vapor that appears for a little while. And so the first thing he lists here, beginning, let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 13. 
He says, but having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. Now, he's saying the same spirit of faith is this same attitude or outlook, and he quotes Psalm 116, a psalm of a person, if you read the entirety of the psalm, in significant adversity and it's significant pressure from others around him. But despite the adversity, he speaks out. In other words, we could call this Paul saying, I'm going to speak truth over trouble. I'm not going to let the trouble, the trials, the difficulties change my direction of focus in my life as to who I am. And the idea is that Paul and the psalmist are similar in circumstance and attitude by a similar faith. They may be generations apart, but it's the same reality. And it is today for us as well. You see, these things don't change, do they? He, he says, we believe, therefore we speak. Our faith and mouth practice go together. In fact... Let's look back just for a moment to Luke, if you would. If you want to turn in your, your Bible to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, the words of Christ Himself, Luke 6 and verse 45. Let me just read in this statement a little bit where, where Christ is teaching, and He's talking about, by your fruit you'll be known, those that produce fruit, the kind of fruit that God produces through them are of him, and those that don't aren't of him. And he says, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth, notice this, speaks from that which fills his heart. Our lives matter. And what's going on in our life matters. And chief in our lives is our mouth, is what comes out of our mouth. Christ says, of your words, you'll be condemned or be praised. Of your words, you'll be judged. And he says, therefore we believe, therefore we speak. Mouth and practice are faith and mouth Faith inside, who I am, and mouth go together by practice, in other words. So Paul is consistent with the Old Testament saints and the words of Christ, and he is sharing his heart when he speaks with his mouth. And that, that of course, is exactly what we need today. We don't need some pretty little things to, to, to dress up and, and look pretty and smell good and all that. Now, I mean, not, that's nice to, to have. But what we need is truth, don't we? Transforming truth in our lives. And so when we get to verse 14, he says, Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. Now, what he's telling us here is knowing here is it's constant thinking that this is Paul's hope and motivation. This verse sets the foundation for Paul's dialogue in this entire paragraph. He's in addressing this extreme persecution and death even, but he is saying, in effect, so what? So what? God raises the dead. That's why, you know, I mentioned last time Fox's Book of Martyrs and all the martyrs and all the people that have died on behalf of Christ and because of their faith. So what? They are blessed. They are blessed because, again, the rope, that little piece of my life is nothing compared to eternal life. Yeah. Worsby, and I put that in the bulletin, until a person says, until a person is prepared to die, he's not really prepared to live. And of course, that is the whole idea of faith and living by faith for Christ. Seeing a future with Him. 
being prepared to die. And of course, that spreads to not only physical death, but that spreads to death of myself. Again, not my will, but it is changed for his will, for his will. Now, Paul uses this word here, knowing, which is oida, which means to perceive as a reality. It's a settled conviction, or he has absolute confidence. It's not even an issue of question, and this is the basis for his actions. Knowing. It's a, it's a given. He says, will raise us also. So as sure as Christ, and that also there is, was raised, and this gets to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We don't have time to go there. But it is a certain promise. He was the first fruits. And we will follow him if we are in him. And so that is, this is the basis of the truth of Christianity. And he also says here, and will present us with you. That, that's an encouraging statement there. He, the you there is referring to those that, of them that are in Christ. Notice this, a reunion is ahead. I don't know about you, but I am really looking forward to that many dear ones in my life. And many from this church have already departed. Boy, it's going to be so good to see them. Now, I enjoy being here with you right now. Don't get me wrong. But I also want to look forward to seeing them. There's going to be a reunion. I, my mom and dad are there. Oh, I've got a, a brother and a sister. I, I, and, and on and on down the line, I've got brothers again and sisters in Christ Jesus that I'm looking forward to a time of reunion with will present us with you. Now, this is the hope. This is our hope. And when we talk about hope in the scripture is this, we're not talking about, gee, I hope so, you know. No, this is a sure thing. This is a hope that is absolutely firmly fixed. It is the bottom line in every detail of life for the Christian then, funnels through this as it does it makes all the difference in our attitude for living if i know where i'm going i can live in accordance with where i'm going and that's what paul is saying that he's doing here when we get to verse 15 he says for all things are for your sakes so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of of God. There is so much in these passages, and I know I'm skirting through them, but I'm trying to keep them in the right context. All things, he says, are for your sake. As Christ died for his people, Paul mirrors Christ. Uh, Christ gave his all for your sake and for my sake. Hard to understand that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might not be made the righteousness of God in him. And, and this really relates back even to what Paul said in, back in verse 12, death works in us, but life in you. In other words, by the testimony of him dying to self and living for others, that they might know the truth and that the light might come to them and that their heart might be receptive to the truth and they might be changed in Christ, it produces life in them. And that's what he was all about, just like Christ was all about. He's an extension of Christ. And you and I are to be extensions of Jesus Christ. He says, grace, this grace spreading may cause the giving of thanks, which is like saying it takes this degree of effort to bring the right result. Uh, Christianity is not something cheap. It, it may be by grace, but it's not a cheap grace in some sense of the word. It took the blood of Christ. And it takes a transformed life. And it takes an opposition focused on Christ in a world that is, an, uh, is opposed to Him and is doing all the things from the God of this world to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And this, when it is presented 
and seen and understood and is transforming, what does it do? It causes the giving of thanks, and not only that, it abounds, he says here, to the glory of God, which, by the way, is the ultimate purpose of every Christian. This is, uh, you know, Westminster Confession, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we can't glorify God or enjoy Him forever if we're not pleasing to Him, if we're not doing what He commands us to do. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that's why Paul says, I have the same spirit of faith as the psalmist, as the Old Testament saints, and it's all to abound to the glory of God as the specific purpose of every Christian. And so, with this also is seen this big, big, big fact that whatever we as Christians go through in this life, in the immediate, has an eternal purpose. Because we're talking about eternal things. When people truly come to Christ, there is an eternity to that in the life of that person they are different and they are become God's own dear son, adopted into the family of God, living eternally and gloriously with him. So it's not just for ourselves, you see, that these things are done. We're talking again about testimony. And you see, all of these relationships all of these testimonies, what Paul is doing, what you and I must do and the way we live and think and the priorities of our life, they all interlock together. They're all interlocked to together. And this is what God uses and purposes, etc. And with this, he gives something we will call supernatural vitality, beginning in verse 16. Now, Paul's really really, really under the gun, you know. But he says here, therefore we do not lose heart. That's amazing. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. In the heat of Paul's thinking, he says, we don't lose heart. Why? Well, our outer man is decaying. Our mortal self, our physical being is declining and you know as well as I do that there's so much focus and emphasis in the media and everywhere in society upon youthfulness and upon health and so forth and hanging on to that. And people have surgery and they, and they take all these vitamins and, you know, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I think we should do whatever we can to, 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 to improve and, and maintain our physical strength and so forth and so on. But ultimately, that's impossible. <laughs> We're all going to fall apart if we keep living. Right? And I know you're looking up here at me and saying, boy, have you fallen apart? Yes. And I'm in the process, and it's going rapidly. And we're all in that process. Now, you see, this is reality of the temporary. But see, Paul is looking beyond the temporary. He's looking... For eternity. And focusing on eternity helps my thinking, helps my perspective, helps my service focus now. That's why, you know, at the top priority after all of the theology in Romans chapter 12, when Paul talks about uh, present your body a living sacrifice, then he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because the world's not going to do that for you. It requires the Word of God. That's why I trust that partly, part of the reason, a big portion of the reason, you attend church. And, of course, that in itself is not adequate either. You need to be in God's Word. You need to be studying to show yourselves approved. You need to know Christ. And it ne you never run out of your need for that. 
This is personal responsibility that we are to take full advantage of. And so Paul in these tough situations could state, therefore we do not lose heart. Why do we not lose heart? Because God provides in the immediate and Paul with that has an eternal perspective. Now, we already know from Scripture that God does give vitality that overcomes the difficulties of life. Christ himself says that. And the only reality otherwise for the unbeliever is decay and hanging on to something that is temporary and is the grass withers and the flower fades and that's foolishness. So that we can say with those that have their anchor in a Joel Osteen ministry for your best life now, and you've probably heard this before, indeed it is their best life now because that's all they have. But we're clinging to a future hope in Jesus Christ. It's where you're going that counts. And the Christian renewal is going on day by day. It has to do with our regeneration, our new creation, the fact of eternal life, and it has a future thrust to it. And as sojourners in this spirit of faith, God grants us a sense of supernatural well-being in the midst of the difficult, terrible circumstances that may come our way and will at times and some more than others, but you know what I mean. But our perspective must be and is, it should be, in Christ Jesus, therefore, we do not lose heart because the focus is on eternity. And so that he says, here's the supreme perspective where I really wanted to get. Oh, do I love these two verses. Look at verse 17. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Well, here he, he makes this contrast, which Paul loves to do. And he's calling the difference between the glorious e eternity that awaits us as something that breaks the scales of importance in the immediate. The value and worth is pictured as with scales. That's why this word weight is used. I think of that which is uh, at the Supreme Court where the, you have scales supposedly of justice with a blind person looking at it and weighing things in the scales of justice. And he uses here a comparison of light over here, which would go wing way up here, as compared to heavy over here. So the scales go to the bottom on the side of eternal glory. And he says that these afflictions are light. And he's not trivializing matters. Some of the afflictions going on even in this body of believers are huge, but not by comparison to eternity. They're nothing. And that's where our perspective must go. They're nothing. And this is all an issue of faith. And this faith and understanding of this concerning these difficulties forms our attitude. And what does the Christian know? Even in the immediate. Aside from this, what we're talking about. What does Romans 8, 28 say? He works all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. In other words, God's always doing what's best for us. And it may be in that little short span of our life, it takes a bunch of ugly stuff, so to speak, to purify us, to straighten us, to mold and shape us. And in that we should rejoice and find our comfort in Romans 8, 28. Or how about 1 Corinthians chapter 
10 and verse 13. Not God never gives us more than we can handle. This is a wonderful promise. Where he says, no temptation, and that word can be translated trial, has overtaken you. That is not common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. He knows exactly the right prescription in the circumstances of our life that we need with an eternal perspective. And I'll get you to turn to 1 Peter just for a moment and remind you of that wonderful passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 6 beginning. He's talking here, if I back up to 5, that you're protected by the power of God through faith. Notice this, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, he's on the same page as Paul here. His focus is on what God has promised, and he is set in his faith upon that promise. And he says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. And, look, and notice the, the purpose of that. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When that rope turns white and it goes out into eternity... And this little bit of goings on here that were all about getting you prepared and purified and straightened out and corrected, perhaps chastened or whatever it is in preparation for glory by comparison doesn't matter. And Paul could say this as a man with incredible inf afflictions. Even back in our text, if, if we just look, even in, the, even in this chapter 4, if we look back up at verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, etc., etc. So his trials, his difficulties were even all related to his ministry, but it all had a righteous, holy purpose, and Paul understood that, and you and I need to understand the same thing in our life. And by this, he's not suggesting, by the way, that pain is not real and suffering is not real, but he is saying God gives the strength, motivates through the difficulty in faith by faith, because of the ultimate glorious eternal future that is in store for all in Christ Jesus. Now you see, he calls it here momentary. That's very interesting. And when you're thinking about the rope, and really, again, that's a, a pretty small view of what we're talking about. When we're talking about eternity, this momentary thing, this temporary thing, when one mentally and spiritually compares with what we go through here in this short span of time is insignificant to what awaits. And that's the attitude development of the Christian with an eye to eternity, looking forward to that. And you'll also notice here in this passage the word producing, producing. These afflictions right now have a role in us, again, for this glorious future, which we're being fitted for. I, I guess I need to turn you again to 1 Peter, this time again to chapter 5. Just, just look at how this, these concepts are all blended in in the Holy Scriptures. Look at verse 10 of chapter 5 of 1 Peter. After you have suffered for a little while, you see that little while fits with momentary light afflictions. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory. There's that eternity view again, you see. 
in Christ will himself, notice, perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's what God's doing. There is absolute purpose in all of this. It's not a happenstance, and God hasn't abandoned you if you love him and you're having difficulties in your life. And such trials are a little while as compared to eternity. I like to think in terms of the life of Paul. He's one of my favorite characters in the scripture. Went through a tough time, got his head severed finally. But he said, I fought a good fight and I finished my course and I kept the faith. Where's Paul been the last 2,000 years? Up there. Up there in glory. And when, well, how, how long will it go on? Eternally. Be nice getting to talk to Paul. I, I'm not sure that I'm worthy to do that, but I'm going to. I'll be so thankful to talk to him and so many others. Now, all men suffer, including the unsaved. But the unsaved have really no merit in their suffering. In fact, suffering for an unsaved person often produces bitterness. But that's not what's going on here with Paul. Paul is referring to suffering from opposition or developmental Oppos er, things, because that's obviously what Peter was talking about. So it is, it includes all suffering because all of this has purpose of God if we are in Christ to make us more like our Lord Jesus Christ, to prove our faith, to test us, and to try us. And that's why this whole concept of best life now really works contrary to the reality of the fallen world. One of the Puritans, Richard Baxter, had a famous sermon which he titled, titled Preaching as a Dying Man to Dying Men. That's more like the reality. A dying man to dying men. And it also works contrary, I hope you see, to the purifying work of God to make us more like Christ. How can I possibly think when I read the Holy Scriptures and, uh, and the characters that are in here that Christianity is somehow all about causing fair weather and happiness and, 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 and worldly joy and all the prosperity and all this other stuff upon me right now, and that's the goal of it. How ridiculous, how utterly false and futile. He says here in this, back in our text, that it's an eternal weight of glory which reflects the perfect work of God in a comparison. Can you imagine when God exercises, in some sense, the full extent of what He has created? For those that love him, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man all that God has in store for them that love him. Can you imagine that? Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And he goes to prepare a place for you. And I'll come again and receive you to myself. Some of you have some really nice homes. They're a shack, my friend, compared to his dwelling places. They don't even, they don't measure up, I'm sorry. And by the way, you've got, maybe you do, I don't know, termites and wood rotting and leaky shingles and the wind that fell out or whatever. But you won't find that in heaven, this place he's preparing for those who love him the Lord Jesus said store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and thieves break in and steal here it's called glory beyond all comparison store it up for there now 
How do you do that? Live for Christ with an eternal perspective. Trusting Him, being a light, being a blessing, etc., etc. Being a fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, kindness, etc. Living out the life of Christ. In closing, look with me at Luke chapter 12. The Lord Jesus gives this little parable here that it is a beginning in verse 16 about a man who had wrong focus and that's really all this is about he says he told them he was first of all if we back up to verse 16 he's talking about beware of the every form of greed and then he gets into verse 16 he told them a parable the land of a rich man was very productive and he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and all my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul? Now he's talking to himself here, by the way. Me, myself, and I. Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. By the way, that's what the natural man thinks, and that's exactly what this fellow is thinking, as if there is no accounting and no end to this fallen world. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? Notice this, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself. There's the issue. He's doing everything for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, the, Paul's not suggesting here from this teaching that Christians become irresponsible in their dealing with world, the world and things, nor is, we know that there's other scripture teaching all manner of responsible activities as a child of God we should be the best at this and the best at that, the best employee and, and, uh, and deal with all manner of fairness and kindness in every way and all the things that we do. He's talking here about an attitude, an eternal perspective that puts the focus on our life, leading our decisions and actions in the right framework of serving God and doing His will, being rich toward God. God, and I would say with a view to eternity because everything in our life and every decision and every priority should be pushed through that grid of thinking. Well, that changes everything, believe me, in my attitude. It's an issue of being rich towards God. You know, a little later in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul will say, we have as our ambition, whether at home in the body or absent in the body eternally, to be what? Pleasing to God. That's the bottom line of this, isn't it? That's rich towards God. And so we've seen Paul's attitude, his face was set towards eternity. And I hope that in some sense today, if you've been off tr track somewhere, <laughs> that this kind of thinking is corrective and helpful to you. It is to me to get my head straight, to keep on keeping on in my love affair with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, it's all about faith. It's all about faith. And that's why he says in verse 18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 
You know that, that Hebrews 11, 1 said, faith is the evidence of things not seen. And yet he says, we look, which has the idea of anticipation. It's part of our attitude. And we know that that's what those that are listed in that hall of faith there, they all did. That's why they persecute, uh, perse persevered through all the difficulties that were brought their way because they were constantly holding on to the promises of God by faith. They looked not at the things that were seen, that's what natural man does, but the things that were not seen. Now let me just tell you, if God says it, there isn't anything stronger than that. I don't care what, you may see something and you think you saw it and you didn't see it, but when God speaks, it's nailed down, brother and sister. And that's the things that are not seen that he tells us to trust in. And this shapes Paul's attitude, and it shapes our attitude, and I hope it shapes your attitude to convict us to be followers of Christ and live for him, which is such an awesome, awesome privilege. Let me bow in prayer, please. Father, thank you for your convicting word, for truth that transforms, for the reality of what you have promised. Father, give us all strength and vision for the future, that whatever we encounter this coming day, this, these coming weeks, coming years, if we live that long, that you'll strengthen us through it and help us and guard our steps that our eyes may be fixed upon you and that we would walk by faith and not by sight. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.